Hello, and thank you, everyone, for another episode of the Cultured Nerd Podcast. This is number two this week. This is episode 24. We are going to be sitting down today with Ray Garza, creator, writer, and artist of Tank McGregor and the Cosmic Closets. It's the new second volume of the Tank McGregor season. We've also got publisher Mark Burnell with us as well from Lesser Known Comics. So sit back, enjoy the ride, and let's talk comics. unmute people because apparently we're all still muted no let them talk let them be free let me talk <laughs> uh, how you guys doing uh, yeah we had a lot of fun with that one <laughs> uh doing well uh it's been a hot minute since we've had you here and got a chance to connect with all of you it feels like so much time has happened i'm so excited that we're here. We are back with volume two. Uh, uh, when it go, I know that I feel like people, you know, they know it's a big deal that it's coming out. But congratulations, you did it! All of that work, all of that stuff, all the lateness nights and weird text messages and Slack groups. It's you have brought the art to the world. Uh, how has this process been the second time around? Um, I, first of all, I feel like you should add applause sound effects throughout that whole little intro um they really connect Might have anything ready? did you have no, anything no we'll get it in post. <laughs> okay we'll do it we'll do it in post we'll do it in post yeah okay um it was crazy i mean when i finished the first book i essentially said yeah i'll never do this again that was a whole whirlwind um and like just three weeks later i was already at it again i was starting to draw different panels for a brand new adventure that i didn't know what was it was going to turn out to be and um then after having met mark and uh gotten in touch with lesser known comics and met all a bunch of other wonderful people in the community it really convinced me that like no i want to keep doing this i want to do more of these and i want to do a whole second book and i just started and whereas the first one i would sort of do as a hobby and i would like stop it for a few months and then get back on it and for a few months and then back off it took me like a longer time this second book was just two and a half years nonstop of doing it and uh, iterating on the plot lines and iterating on, on the on the art and mixing things and putting things the way they should be and just kind of like slowly forming it and having it organically turn into a what turned out to be 175 pages of volume two. Um, so it definitely was awesome crazy sometimes kind of felt like oh my god this is not as funny as the first one. Oh my god this is funnier than the first one it was a challenge to like try to match what people seem to really enjoy about the first one um and and i and i was starting to feel self-doubt about like well is this really a tank joke or is it not really a tank joke like is it gonna land is it not gonna land and at one point i had to just like kind of stop myself and remind myself that like it's just my version of dad jokes or like my version of humor that is what Tank McGregor is. So if I just kind of like focus on that, uh, I could trust that people will enjoy it just as well. For sure. And I feel that that, uh, sh that inner struggle that you were dealing with, it kind of comes across in the book, not in any of the, uh, not in the writing per se, but our character deals with almost a struggling of their voice as well. So to hear you say all of that, I can see I I enjoyed where you take it. And funny enough, it's crazy to hear that, um, not crazy, but this idea that was an idea in a napkin, which then became reality in that first volume, which was a passion project, to now hear you take it on. Because from this book, I can think of, at least several places or references in within the world that I'm like, let's go there now. Like, and I don't know. And, and the first book I was, I don't know if I saw that necessarily. There's lots of fun allusions to the world, but now it's like, oh, I know the quest we're on and there's other things going on. So I, there's a, it, you flushed out a lot more in this world and I enjoyed the tone of it very much. 
Yeah, definitely, man. Like, whereas the first one was very much like takes place, I believe, in one single planet because I was essentially, I guess, lazy. I mean, the planet is a desert planet. Like, I was like, <laughs> no, I can draw there. The second one, I went in there with the very uh, uh, obvious goal of like, I'm going to go on different planets, different adventures. I'm going to try to draw cities this time. I'm going to create a religion. I'm going to do a cave system. I'm going to do like a whole bunch of different like scenarios. Now I'm going to do snow. Now I'm going to do this. And I just kind of kept mixing it up and like kept taking what I saw as the reader going through like an adventure of like, it never stays the same. If it's going to be a, a much longer book, it's constantly changing. And I also did, I, I love um, when uh, properties do world building and when they don't even necessarily, um, when they spend huge chunks of just like world building and like setting up like the world you live in, but not necessarily do a story that has to do with certain things you see in the background, you know, right. you're still in your main plot but you feel like you're a smaller cog in a larger arena. Um, I kind of mixed up my metaphors, but yeah. <laughs> no, it, it reminds me, like everything you just said, it, like how you're like, oh, I don't want to do that again. That was so much, it pretty much like described having kids. Like when you have your first one, you're like, wow, that was terrible. I'm never doing it again. And then as soon as you see the baby, you're like, all right, who's ready for round two? I want more. And, and then with, <laughs> how you described, uh, the book itself, book one was A New Hope, where you only had two, three locations throughout the entire movie. And now you have Empire Strikes Back, and here's like 25 different locations, and it's a lot bigger. The world All great science fiction starts on a desert planet. All of yeah. them. All the All great ones. So the fact that Tate McGregor does that speaks very speaks very highly of you as a writer. I mean, just the fact that you said it's A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, that's like, my God, the best compliment ever. If you'd have said it's The Rise of Skywalker, I would have left... Well, as long as the third one doesn't become that, we're we're good. <laughs> no. Uh, I absolutely know that you have ideas for the next one. Uh, regardless of talking about that future work, it, were there any side stories or ideas that you had that didn't make it into this one? Was there any other asides or any sort of work that you had? That we have it that you wanted to put in this one, but it just didn't make it. It would have put you over that two hundred mark. Yeah, I mean, I have ten completed pages um, that are just not in the book at all that uh, have to do with uh, Jensen's backstory a little mm. more and, and who exactly Jensen is and how Jensen is the way it is, you know. And also, um, I believe there are certain references to uh, someone in Tank's life that he he no longer has. And how that someone is now some like has a connection to Jensen. So I had all that, um, and it, and I was going deeper into who the Zen Corporation is, and who uh, Atlas Zen is, and and why they're looking for them. And I had, I mean, an entire uh, plot line. And in fact, when I decided I had to abandon that because a, it was just not. Not that it wasn't going anywhere, but it wasn't no longer fitting within the frame of the story I was telling. It was just completely like a side project, not side project, like a side chapter. It felt like when Marvel tries to like set up their next movie, and because of that, the current movie like uh, fails a little bit. You know? Yeah. That's what it's yeah. Like yeah. So I just like, why that. is this episode here? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was exactly. my problem with Black Panther. There was five Iron Mans in that movie. There's an Iron Man suit, and then they're like, guess what? We made another robot suit, and then this girl, she made a robot suit. It's like, okay, so it's a robot suit movie. And it's all kids. Um, yeah, exactly. No, it was. It, it, it would have been ridiculous. So I ended up just kind of not scrapping it completely because I still want to go back to that uh, plot thread. But I did take some of the art from that and repurpose it into the book. Like, oh, well, this was supposed to be that setting. But it'd be great for the uh, for the for the beginning of this other setting. So I put it there. Mm. You know what I mean. So I, I kind of stripped it for parts a little bit. Uh, I would like to pitch you Space Smash Mouth. They are a <laughs> band, but they have nothing to do with Earth Space Smash Mouth. But Space <laughs> Smash Mouth is one of the biggest bands in the universe. It's one of the biggest ones. There's other bands that are like good, but like not as good as Space Smash Mouth. <laughs> is Smash Mouth like a particular? Why is Smash Mouth? Uh, they're a terrible band. They just polluted the nineties. They, I feel like, I feel like they were like a cool band when I was in the seventh grade, and then in high school they were the Shrek movie. And it's like I can't do nothing with this band anymore. 
they've made it. They they wrote their they made their dreams come true on the back of one song. So I feel like the space version of it is like Led Zeppelin to a million. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because like I, I had an idea that never materialized into anything. That like the spaceship, a uh, tank spaceship, the Rakutansky runs on a sound drive, which is like the only way you can get it to go is if you like play sound at it. And the only way that it could run perfectly is if you play Rush. <laughs> it's like such a convoluted way of like getting Rush in there and like you can't even hear it. So it's like, why? I like this. I feel like it's an idea that's like not quite there yet. <laughs> no, I, I like the idea exactly where it's at. That's amazing. Um, there was uh, an episode of, uh, and stay with me as I go on this tangent for a second. Um, there's an episode of the, the cartoon Teen Titans Go where they did this like four or five part mini story arc called the the night begins to shine and it's essentially like the titans get sucked into this 80s psychedelic rock universe and they have to use the power of music to defeat the enemy and everything about that is like kind of i imagine this comic fitting in that universe very well like this is just sound is what carries the universe together and it has to be 80s rock or it doesn't or the universe falls apart yeah. <laughs> well, we do get introduced. Now, I don't remember if it was in the first book, but audio slugs are now a thing. And whatever whatever that does to people, we have no idea. We don't see any audio slugs, but they're somewhere in the background. It's just a way of downloading music in the future, I guess. You know, you, you don't download through MP3s anymore. You just purchase the audio slug, let it latch itself into your brainstem and enjoy the music. Well, you're obviously thinking in the – you're obviously thinking in uh, – in rare air because you know guardians three had a lot a lot of the imagery in that movie was like flesh technology right like we've all seen star trek doors uh and maybe this is also the influence of rick and morty maybe on the zeitgeist but like there was a lot of like you know there's just a lot of buttholes in that movie like just ships and stuff <laughs> like that it's like okay the kids it's fine it's a it's a organism but like it's just lots of weird stuff so yeah audio slugs are par for the course Put, sign me up, boss. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel like uh, there are like Rick and Morty writers that eventually went to, to do Marvel stuff. I heard that uh, uh, Quantumania had Rick and Morty writers, which makes a lot of sense if you watch that movie. Um, yeah. Although it didn't really translate well. I, I did not like that movie. But uh, but yeah, Rick and Morty is definitely a huge inspiration for a lot of people, I think. And even if it's not, it's something, in, you know, it's in the back of their brains. You know what I mean? It's something that they watched or something like that. And they saw it and it, you know, it all gets well, added. It's just, to the so, it's just so damn good. Like Rick and Morty is like the pinnacle of like sci-fi ex existential humor and storytelling, which is like, you can't even try to compare yourself. And you are going to, even through osmosis, like get some inspiration, even if you think like, oh, I'm being completely original. Like, no, like they already probably did it first and way better. Well, we're at a weird spot right now now that we're having Rick and Morty talk with everybody, um, you know, the one of the creators is out. They're going to, he's Rick and Morty will be voiced by the best sound alike or AI, whatever Warner brothers cartoon network decides to do. And the show really, it'll be interesting to see what it looks like under Dan Harmon's direction. I feel like a lot of Rick and Morty, it's like, who knows which way it is. It's like, no, we're going to have a pretty idea. We have a pretty good idea of who's the captain of the ship right now. And, to see what ideas or what the show becomes or what it changes into, because it will no longer be whatever it was. Um, well, they did uh, start. I don't know how much of this was like panic mode, uh, putting out a fire or whatever, but they did end up saying that like, oh, you know, uh, Dan Harmon has been a little like creative voice mainly for that show for a long time now. And uh, the other guy whose name I'm blanking yeah. on right now, uh, Justin Roiland, really didn't do anything besides the voices at this point. It's like, really? Because... He seems like a, he's got a particular brand of humor that's very prevalent prevalent in the in that show. Yeah, which is yeah, which is interesting too because they also like he was also exonerated, and now it's like, is he going to come back? Are they going to apologize for dumping him, or are we just going to pretend like nothing ever happened and just sweep it under the rug and he's still fired? But yeah, it's going to be very know. interesting to see where that show goes next. Even though it's, I don't know, it could be very much like The Witcher, where like now Henry Cavill's out after this next season and Netflix just announced they're doing season five on top of season four. So they're already double downing on two seasons without Henry and the really? fans aren't going to show up. Yeah. If they're going <laughs> to film in those locations, just do another day and we'll get the next shot too. You know what I mean? Like I, there's a certain, 
they're you know in for a penny in for a pound at a certain point with those shows and i feel like they're like in scandinavia or whatever country you know or czechoslovakia wherever they're doing this and it's like yeah let's stay a little bit longer and do the next episode (laughs) Yeah, and I don't yeah. want to get into The Witcher because Mark knows how I can get about pop culture with something that I'm passionate about. <laughs> what, what, a, what, a te- what a terrible position for what's his face Hemsworth to um, to be stuck in, because n- it's like no one wants him to stay. They, what everyone wants is him to pick up the phone and be like, "Hey, Henry, can you do it instead?" And I'll just leave, and we'll pretend none of this happened. Like. Because even if he does the best job possible, right? Like there's just there's just like no winning. There's just no winning for him. And that's just like there's a like whoever whoever talked him into being like, yeah, you should you should just jump right in that. There must have been a dump truck worth of money. I feel like that guy wasn't even liked that much before this whole thing. Like he was the other Hemsworth, you know, like okay, Hunger Games. No one likes him in Hunger Games. And what else? He got killed in that one Expendables, Expendables movie. Yeah, Real and fast. and now uh, Miley Cyrus is quietly dumping all over him in every song she puts out. So yeah, dude, it's a. Uh, I can buy myself flowers. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a very weird position. Um, but I don't know. I, I I kind of respect. I know it's we're on this tangent now. I kind of respect Henry's decision to leave that show because of how they flagrantly disregarded the source material. But, I mean, it shouldn't be hard for them to fix it. I mean, if you want Henry back, just follow the source material. Like, stop doing your own thing. Hire some writers who actually read the books. Like, <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, not making up their own stuff. Not, <laughs> not only did they not read them, they clearly disliked the whole books because they were just doing their own thing. And it's like, oh, we're writers right. and we have a fantasy world to play with. Let's do our own thing. Like, it's... I feel like like the situation that Mark just pointed out, like even if he knocks it out of the park, I feel like the Amazon's Lord of the Rings show is in the same position now. There's so much divisiveness over that first season. And there's there's like high highs, but like really low lows in that show that's hard to like get into. Like even if another season knocks it out of the park, I don't know if people will go back and watch that first season. And then you're like catching up your audience from this like, oh, okay, from step two, now we got to do it like that. Yeah, I think yeah. that people are also really, um, uh, like with the Ted Lasso show, we're doing three seasons. It's got first, second, third act. We're out, right? So people are like, why, why, how many seasons of this thing? And we're just like, oh, yeah, we're just going to milk this thing for all it's worth. And then it'll die a, a, a slow, horrible death where we all hate what we're producing. You know, uh, that's my plan for Tim McCurry. Yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think more people are going to be drawn to the fact that like people who will sign on to do a show, do a series, and be like, "We're doing two, you know, two ser- you know, two seasons of this, and then we're out, or three seasons, and then we're out." You know, well, um, we're in an interesting timestamp right now of this episode happening just at this point in time in the world because the writers' strike is happening here in Hollywood. Um, are you? Even though you are in a different medium, are you at all being affected by this? Other than all of these TV shows we're talking about are not going to see production for the next six months. So besides us not being able to talk about Rick and Morty for another two years, uh, are you guys being affected by it at all? I've been um, watching a I lot agree. of Bravo with my wife. So. Okay. Yeah. Reality's <laughs> not going anywhere. Yeah. no, really, Yeah. And this season of Vanderpump Rules is... Next level. Oh, my God, dude. Two... two it is where Hulk Hogan was fighting the Iron Sheik. Good. That is the level of conflict and and, and just yeah. Oh, the, the, the heels on the heels on that show have heat like no one's had in a long time. Mm-hmm. Man, everything I know about Vanderpump Rules, I've been, I've learned against my will. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the biggest thing in our house right now. Saying my wife is like telling me like yeah, and then. Uh, uh, so and so Ariana cheated with uh, Robert, and oh my god, they're having a reunion and this and that. And I like know everything about everything. I, I don't think I've seen a single frame of that show. I don't think people understand that Bravo is female Marvel comics. Like there is a <laughs> meta to that universe that I know. I know when I'm talking at my wife about uh, Star Wars and she's zoning out. I do the same thing when I'm like, okay who's getting divorced and she's like that one her and it's like okay now i gotta get into this world yeah exactly the same and i'm like oh she's hot no no we hate her oh yeah she sucks 
Yeah. Yeah, I catch it in glimpses where I'm just like walking by and I'm, then I'm like not really paying attention. And then I'm like, wait, what did he just say? I'm like, fuck that dude. <laughs> right? And then I like sit down and I'm like, okay, now, now I'm in it. Okay. I'm invested. <laughs> Here we go. They get you, they get you on those fights. They get you on those fights. Cause then you come back for the commercial. You're like, all right, I'll go do this thing. But then like, what's the resolution of that fight? And then they just fight harder. Well, here's the brilliance I mean, of it. It's outsourcing, having shitty friends. That's the whole thing, right? <laughs> so those friends that you just want to talk shit about all the time, but then you don't have to invite them to your parties or like go to their weddings. Well, and we're at a certain age in our lives now where, you know, Brandon doesn't get to come over anymore. Your wife has talked to you. The girls get really upset. Like Brandon's not allowed to come over anymore. Becky can't come to the house during a school night because Becky's got a weird drinking problem. And it's like, we don't talk about it, but like, right. These shows, you get to see the person like, Oh, what if someone ruined your daughter's fifth birthday party? <laughs> what if somebody just like flipped a table and made it about themselves on a five-year-old's birthday party? What would happen? And then you, that's, that's real housewives. <laughs> this conversation yeah. took a turn. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I the one that I did get sucked in, or I got sucked in like season one, and I've seen every single season is Love Is Blind. I don't know if anybody's seen Ooh, that. Oh my god, my wife sucked me into that show, and she was like, she's like, you got to watch this. I'm like, I don't want to watch this. She's like, you're gonna do it, and I'm like, no. And then all of a sudden, now I'm watching it with her. <laughs> I, I dude, I sucked my wife into that show. Like, I was the one who started watching it because it was like week one of COVID, <laughs> and I just, I, I just love it. It's a great show. It's a great audio show because you can play on your phone. I haven't been able to get into the international versions because I have to read too much. Like, you know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, if I could just check emails and also have something in the background. Like, I'd love to watch the Japanese one, but I it's I haven't put the time into it yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I stick with the American one. Only because, yeah, I don't want to have to read. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, here we are. We're talking. We we should be talking about another thing, but we're talking about all the wonderful things and nerddoms and things that get done and that we talk about in our personal lives. How does anything get done in your office? How do you not start talking about RoboCop and then how do you move into like having a business conversation about actually doing what we want to be doing? Yeah, well, it's uh, my wife asks that question all the time because it's it, she's just like there's a lot of laughing coming from the office, you know, and I'm always like, yes, you know, working with comic book creators like every day, it's it's pretty, and uh, you know the the cool thing is uh, I get to see these characters, and it was funny because like I was reading Tank McGregor in the Cosmic Colossus, and I was like. I feel like what Tank went through during that time frame, it was 2022 to now, right? Like, <laughs> that's like, a that's like, a pretty when, heavy, and that's a really heavy stuff to be dealing with. I, and 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 you know, uh, so actually, shortly after we were on your show last time, right? So we had Digital Wizards of Doom going on. We had uh, the Batch Four with with Tank McGregor, and a lot of cool stuff was happening. And I was just getting like burnout, burnout, burnout. You know, and then like when I was reading that line where like Tank's like, I haven't heard my inner monologue in, you know, in months. I was like, I was like, I know, I know, man. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's, I relate it's funny. To this. <laughs> yeah, it's funny to, to kind of, you get windows into other people's <clears throat> perspective, you know, the, the creators, like how they see the world and their storytelling and whatever. And it's weird how you'll, like at least for me I'll, I'll latch on to some characters and i'll be like oh my gosh this this is my person this person knows what i'm going through and it just it's particularly cool just to be in that room with the creators you know um and it's also very cool to see like um what my daughter latches on to right she's she's like she's got um we have valor and tweed which is one of our newer books she's got um She's got the little bunny stuffed animal, like she has it, you know, like in the house. So I see him all the time, you know. Um, she was uh, singing a digital Lizards of Doom song earlier, you know. Uh, you know, when you know, one day we'll we'll get her introduced to Tank. You know, it's a little little bit uh, highbrow. Uh, for her. <laughs> I'm flattered. You think it's highbrow? <laughs> 
But, it's uh, highbrow. Don't don't sell yourself short. It's 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 hitting. I know why I know why you say that because you're like, but I make dick and fart jokes. That's fine. The work itself is long enough. So you can have you can have jokes along the way for these bigger payoffs. And the scenes are so great and they're so fun. And the way that we explore more of these characters, it's great that they're tanking his relationship with his crew is so weird. I'm glad we had a whole book to justify it because now we're just on an adventure and everything makes sense. All of my questions about like, oh, the whole, what's the whole do? Is it like a, none of those questions. This is just what it is. And they have a full life of this. Um, Oh, I mean, uh, Shakespeare I, had ta- Shakespeare had fart and dick jokes. Too. Yes, of just, course he just did. To, just to make that apparently hundred <laughs> percent. Earlier, I was telling you that I had like ten whole pages that I just kind of took out of the book. Um, one of the things that those pages answered was, "What's with the hole?" So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, I was planning on answering it, and I didn't. Uh, well, I think and- that probably has to come from the fact that Michael's whole conversation with you about the hole last time was. Does he have sex with that hole? <laughs> I always like, wanted to know. Okay. Now and you're like, now I have to answer it because he'll think that forever. I don't. I, I'm not putting you in that position this time. I understand their relationship more. I think weird stuff happens, but I don't think it has anything to do with that hole. I think it has to do with other things. I think it's weird projections and stuff like that. <laughs> I mean, what else are you going to do with a hole in outer space? I don't know. <laughs> the hole um, is the but, least weird thing about that relationship. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, and it's funny that Mark, you mentioned how like you get a, a glimpse into like uh, people's uh, perception of things based on like their character and stuff. Because definitely, it's not a big spoiler to say because that is the beginning of the book. Um, at the beginning of uh, Cosmic Colossus, Tang McGregor is in, like in a very different place than he was in book one. You know, he's like a little more uh, disheveled. He's got a beard. He doesn't know what he's doing with his life. You know, in the first one, he uh, he he made a decision. That basically got him kicked out of like the bounty hunter league or whatever you want to call it um and he doesn't know what to do he's like well if i'm not a bounty hunter i don't know what i am and a huge part of that like the reason it starts off like that not only i did it not only because it organically fits with the end of the first book but because like in a way uh, i was sort of in the same spot whereas i i I have a background in film and filmmaking and for the longest time i wanted to do i still just want to do movies sometimes um but I had to basically not give up on that dream, but realize that that's not going to happen and no longer do films. And I didn't, I didn't want to do that anymore. I had my taste of like what it was working on sets and on, on movies and on bigger movies. And I, I didn't like it. I didn't like the people. I didn't like what it was all about. Um, so I, I decided I didn't like that anymore. And I was in a point where like, well, if I'm not the film guy, what am I? I don't know where I, I, where I, what I, what I want to do anymore, what I need to, where I need to land creatively. Um, comics, saved me in that sense but that don't know where i where i fit in this universe is what he's going through at the beginning of it and then i realized i had to put in more fart jokes because i was getting really heavy well do we have we have you uh, uh, announced what is a gorak nozzle as i know it's a bad word i know it's not a word you can say around children have we Whoa. defined what this is or is this just something that is this just like the gn word of that universe that's the c word of that universe that is uh, as like the the c word the n word that is all the words <laughs> of that universe i try to think of i can't believe word. i just casually dropped it i apologize yeah, you can't just casually drop drop it but fortunately you mispronounced it so you didn't quite say it. Uh, okay, I put I put an A at the end of it. That's okay. I can okay, whatever version of it. Okay. It's it's work nozzle. <laughs> work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the official pronunciation. But it's just like, yeah, what's like the most offensive thing that I could possibly say that really means nothing? Kind of like <laughs> sure. Like, sure. Words I love it. Words, man. Uh we it's funny that we we were talking about flushing out Tank McGregor. I feel like we maybe saw just one leaf of his family tree, and I don't know how much of that was BS or not. Uh, have you designed any of the other tanks in the family? Are is there a McGregor line in your head? Do they all wear space visors? But like in each era, it's a little bit different. Is this a lineage? Do we know? Have you thought about those things yet? I have not at all, and I'm actually kind of wondering what you're referring to about as uh, the leaf of the family tree. Well, what's reference? When they're in the, uh, when they go see 
the god of randomness, for lack of a better oh, term. Oh, yeah. And they're talking, and, he, and he's kind of like doing, he's kind of pitching him a mile a minute, but this entity, if there wasn't some grain of truth in it, he would say, get out of here. And he goes, yeah, we know through this connection. And I wasn't, I took all of that like, yo, if we were to trace that back, where else does this go? Like, who That's are true. the... Yeah, where else does this lead to? What is his aunt like? You know what I mean? That was where my mind was at. Well, yeah, no. Funnily enough, I, I didn't have a whole genealogy planned or a whole family. And you're right. Like, I was aware that, like, that's the first time that I kind of mentioned any sort of, like, relation to him um, outside of the people you see in the comic. But um, I, I just thought it'd be really funny if, like, they go to this <laughs> giant god machine and for the first two pages they're just fucking like wait where do i know you from like what like whose cousin yeah and cheryl's cousin uh, like it's just like it's such a dumb joke but like i i have to take pride in my it takes two pages to get there <laughs> it pays off very well and i won't i won't say what the payoff is but it pays off very well um and i just took all of that uh, i just took all of that as real i was like great let's go to that let's go to that kids in yarrow what did take mcgregor do what happened <laughs> Uh, and in that world as well, in that scenario, it also made me think like, oh, are you dropping in like take McGregor's mom was a normal later, but uh, was a normal lady, but his dad was one of these inner was some sort of cosmic being or something like that. Cause I was like, you know, you run, it, it's nepotism. You run into those circles. So if you're a, a, you know, if you run in those circles, those are, you know, if Galactus is your dad, you're like, oh, I know other Galactuses. They're a real jerk. You never, you never tipped well. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, no, like, funnily enough, yeah, I don't, like, I have backstory for Tank, but, like, in my head, his backstory goes all the way back to just, like, around the time where he, like, is graduating the Academy and barely becoming a bounty hunter. Yeah, I, I haven't really thought about it so much as to, like, his family and, like, where he grew up. All I know is that he grew up on the wrong side of an asteroid, which is a throwaway line in the first book. Sure. Um, and that he went to a... Uh, okay, so like the school he went to, like the school of Little Miss Gertrude's school of like cosmetology, etiquette, and bounty hunting was just straight from Mr. Mark Vernal, like literally driving back from uh, somewhere. I was dropping him off at the airport. And you mentioned, I don't even know how we got to that, but you mentioned that, that that should be like the school he went to. And I'm like, that's going in the comic. Like, the school of cosmetology, etiquette, and bounty hunting sounds like it's the funniest fucking thing to me. So that's where that bit of like backstory came from. It makes me wonder if under that helmet, it's a perfectly well quaffed hair. You know what I mean? Like it's always miraculous, but you just never see it because he's got a hat on. On classroom A to your left is the bounty hunting shooting gallery. Classroom B to your right, we're going to be doing facial hair. <laughs> and then etiquette. Two hours of etiquette followed by how to stun a perp, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I just imagine like him sense. getting like you know the like the, the 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 there was like a group of bullies in the cosmetology school that was just like stuffing him in a locker or something like that. Where he's like, ah, you know, probably Cosmo Rodriguez. <laughs> Which I'm so excited to figure out a way to make that make that a thing. Uh, there is so much work, not only in the writing and the drawing of all of this. But the executing of that and keeping yourself on a time schedule and all that stuff. Uh, have you even given yourself permission to think of new worlds and new characters that have nothing to do with the Tank McGregor stuff? Um, yes. So when I finished Cosmic Colossus, I de desperately needed a palate cleanser. And I've told several people this. It's like I feel like uh, out, uh, burned out on humor, you know, like just i don't want to make if i do something else i don't want it to be overly comedic like it's okay if it has some lightheartedness to it but i wanted to make it like the, the complete polar opposite i wanted to also like prove to myself that i can write something without like, taking the piss out of every other line um so i do have characters and i do have a more a world than characters uh i just got the characters in it but i already started like penciling different things and i don't know how some other people uh like our very own uh david luhan who does uh, Yuriko and Narita, um, he'll like do something and then he'll like switch gears and do something else. And he's constantly working, constantly drawing. And he does these amazing drawings and he's making all these commissions for all these people. Um, and I don't know how he switches gears. Like with me, I have to like, 
unwind for like and mentally incredibly decompress for a while and let something like really catch my attention because I know I'm going to commit to it for about a year and a half. So I don't want to just kind of like start doing something and then leave it halfway or, or be bored with it, you know, uh, or uh, something that no longer excites me after a month. I want to make sure that it's something that I really want to commit a long time of creatively doing it to. That said, I have that. I have stuff with like that's more uh, uh, grounded, you know, nothing fantastical. I have stuff that is really fantastical. I have more like slice of life ideas, all these things I want to do and nothing I've really like quite decided. This is what I'm going to start doing yet. It's so funny that here I am as you given us so much work already. It's like, can you do more or <laughs> will you do more or what other parts can we cut off you? Because as you were answering that question, I was thinking about like Akira Toriyama known for Dragon Ball and that universe it did become popular and he has worked on other things but that is his opus it's this huge thing and he tries other things and they usually don't go anywhere but the things that get made is he just adds another chapter on let's staple this on let's see what else we could do and there's always more there so i'm glad i'm i'm glad to hear that but it can also you know your dedication to your own ideas to be like oh i'm gonna put a year into this it's like yeah that's a big deal so you do have to be a little bit more choosy. You can't necessarily jump into that something because that's a big deal. Yeah, I think one of the, the irony. I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, please. No, I was just gonna say was one of the things that I I noticed, at, you know, so, so working with all these creators, right? Is um, you know, I talked to Ray quite a bit. You know, and he said, oh, you know, this guy's doing this thing, and then this guy's doing this thing, and this guy's doing three things at a time. You know, and it's like. And then meanwhile, when I hear from them, like the, the other creators is like, Ray's got 300 pages plus of a story, right? In two volumes, right? And it's like so many creators that like, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and Ray admires them and stuff like that. I mean, they would, they would like murder somebody to get to that point where they're had two volumes of their their story and it just goes to show that like no no matter no matter where you get right there's you know that's that's the human condition is there's there's always the next there's always the next thing it's alice in wonderland that garden looks better than the garden of my knit if i was in there i'd be so happy that's a garden filled <laughs> with crazy people so you know it, and it's and it's sometimes you know you can't see our own, you, you know, it's difficult to celebrate our own greatnesses because we're all human monkey bodies and, you know, have to eat, know all of our own flaws because they're the voices in our heads all day long. So yeah, I understand that. Human monkey bodies, new band name, I'm calling it. Uh, yeah. I mean, not as big as Space Smash Mouth, but please use it <laughs> if, if, if you can uh, trickle it in there somehow. Yeah. Uh, um. Were there... It's science fiction, and I'm not like, where do your ideas come from? Uh, but was there anything that you consciously were into? Like, uh, do you are you a UFO guy? Does UFO do, does that sometimes, or some of these ideas? Because you play with some really big ideas that you get inside of your world now. Um, I don't know if this is sci-fi, but I I am I was I mean, there's a religious aspect to this book. It's not like a I don't really get a lot into religion and I don't really bash religion, I don't think. Um, but I always like the idea that like an entire society can have an incredibly strong belief about where they came from. And there's it's it's a hundred percent possible that like where they came from was a child's petri dish experiment, you know? Right. Um it's that Simpsons right episode where Lisa puts her tooth in the Coke and it sprouts a whole civilization and they think she's God, you know? So I, I, I liked that idea and I wanted to play in that area. And that's what came out, you know, mm. explore an entire galactic society. And like, they're so hell bent on like believing in this, like God. Uh, and really it turns out that is it really a God? You know, I don't want to spoil anything. You'd have to read it, but most likely it wasn't, it was some dude, you know? Yeah, but the 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 qualities that we would attribute to a being like that would instantly put them into that realm. We don't talk about 
Superman is a god, but that's what we're talking about. You know what I mean? He is of a level of our myths and fantasies. He is that person. So we define, you know, funny enough, we define that Christ allegory more in terms of science fiction and he is an alien coming from another place. But I mean, Superman looks at us at a molecular level. When he looks at you, he like sees you as a breathing being. He sees your body radiating energy to the universe. Like he doesn't look at you like a guy with a hat on. So, I mean, that's okay. He's just a guy who grew up in Kansas, but that's not the way other people view him. So I think all of those ideas are absolutely justified. I think that it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, what are the stories that we live our own lives by and what flips those narratives? You know what I mean? And as we get older, you hit those different chapters where you're like, oh, I've now turned a page. Like, I do not think that way anymore. But it comes right, with time exactly. and experience and all of that stuff. And a lot of that is, again, attributed to, like, what I was feeling at the time, you know, like, uh, upending my own belief system. And, like, what do I want to believe? I don't know. It, it all just kind of subconsciously vomits out into these pages. Um, and I try to do, like not the complete opposite, but I have sort of like parallels where the whole book is centered around like searching for this God and he's made of uh, uh, somewhat organic material. And to find him, they gotta have, they have to basically ask this other God, right? Like the giant head that like knows everything. He's just a completely mechanical uh, planet sized supercomputer who knows everything. Essentially, yeah, yeah, it's another type of God, you know, like there's more than one God in this universe they're not gods, but like they're gods to someone, you know, something of infinite knowledge would be considered a god by some people, but they just use him as a, a glorified Google, you know, or Ask Jeeves. He's the Ask Jeeves of the universe, and they're, they, you know. Well, I wonder about that now, just with, you know, all of these emerging things, you know, I feel like the first alien we're going to run into is the one that we build at Microsoft. And this entity is going to start interacting with people and is going to want to know things about you. And it'll be interesting to see how we interact with it. It's trying to trick people. It doesn't trick everybody. Most of the time we're like, ah, oh, robot, you got me this time. But I don't know. You know what I mean? I feel all those things are coming. Yeah, dude, it's scary. Um, I don't know how I feel about AI art and AI. I mean, it's the idea of uh, AI people and uh, deep fake and AI voices scares me more than AI art, um, only because I feel like that kind of stuff can be used in the political realm and like we wouldn't even know it. And even if you do know it, you're probably the 2% that's smart enough to see that it's AI and 98% of the population would not know, you know, so the damage is done. I mean, that's getting into way of the whole other topic, but yeah, it's scary, man. AI is scary. Mark, how scared are you of AI? <laughs> I think uh, I think it changes the dynamic on a lot of things. Um, so you know, if you think uh, if you think of the music scene, right? So um, so music used to be driven by um, record sales, right? You get a single, and that's why everyone had like a seven al album deal. You know, and you just have to do one song that's a chart topper. They can get everyone to pay whatever fifteen dollars for what a CD or cassette or whatever was going back in the day. Um, and then Napster happened and LimeWire and all that stuff. And now music's completely changed in the fact that um, the people who are crushing it have amazing live shows. You know, they're doing. You know, they either doing the big Vegas thing, right? You know, where they have this big like whole production thing. Or if you're like an underground band, you're touring and you kick ass live. You suck live. No, no way. Like, um, and they're making their money off of the merch and stuff like that. You know, the other part is, so I see that also in terms of, um, I actually see the AI. So there's a lot of not great things that are happening, right? In terms of uh, people, copyright infringement and stuff like that. But I think what's going to end up happening is, um, I think AI is going to push people offline a lot. And I think that uh, if I think we get humanity off of the internet um, more often um, and into spaces where we're operating or, or interacting, you know, human to human, I think that will generally be a good thing for humanity. Um, because as we see, you know, people say things and do things to each other online that they wouldn't dream or dare of doing uh, in, in regular spaces. Um, so I think that's the general trajectory. So like in the short term, 
it'll suck. I think in the long term, I think we'll we'll have um, some positive gains <laughs> on, on the humanity front. But that's just Mark the Futurist talking. Uh. <laughs> so this is the growing pains of becoming a Type Two civilization. This is just some of the we're gonna we're gonna have to deal with a lot of this terribleness until we can get on the other side of it. I mean, it's funny. I, I was listening to Ronnie Chang say that the internet, they're going to talk about the internet in 50 years the same way we talked about smoking, where they're going to be like, I can't believe they let the internet like near babies, like that, like we let pregnant women use Google. Like there's going to be like signs outside of buildings. It's like, don't use the internet within 50 feet of this like entrance. Like it's, I, I think we're all coming to realize how much of a shit show, you know, unbridled access to technology can be. Well, and we didn't know that we were going to be the consumer. We didn't know that we were going to be the consumer, but we were also hooked up to an IV bag where they sucked our blood because we pay to use these things, but then I am also the thing that's feeding it. The vampire of Instagram wants me to be on there longer, but then it milks me while I'm doing it, yet I see none of those benefits. And the fact that I've now mentioned cashew butter into my phone means Facebook's going to fill my feed with cashew butter. So, I mean, it's a very weird world we're living in where things that used to be synchronicity. Now it's like, well, is it synchronicity or is it the algorithm? Did the algorithm saw me Google something for my wife's birthday? And now I'm seeing cashew butter and I'm going to see that for the rest of the day. So I don't know. I'm excited for the day that my AI overlord says, oh, Mark, your blood sugar is low and you're three blocks from this great taco spot. And guess what? Ray's blood sugar is also low. He also <laughs> needs tacos. We've already called you both Ubers. You're going there. Your favorite stuff has been ordered. I'm just going to like walk in and get like uh, my carne asada burrito or whatever, right? Here, here. As, as, wearable, <laughs> as wearable stuff keeps happening and they're checking your 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 heart and stuff like that maybe when you get your new iWatch you just put a drop of blood on it once a day and it, it'll tell you those things i mean i don't know i mean isn't that the stuff we're monitoring more and more of our own bodies like why would you not do that yeah i i i i wanted to know like when it hears like when it sees like my biomechanics change around certain people that my watch is like, oh, you actually don't like that person. So it'll auto ignore their call because they know like the reaction every time I interact with that person. Well, that's why yeah. Becky's, that's why Becky's not allowed over at a school <laughs> night anymore. It makes dad so much go crazy. Mark just wishes he lived in an episode of Black Mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like he, he doesn't get the point. Yeah. He doesn't see how dystopic it is. He's like, oh, that sounds great. <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> It's ruining people's lives. I mean, that is, yeah, but that's, I mean, Black Mirror and Twilight Zone, it's all of that stuff. It's like any of these technologies, you know, if we extrapolate it out far enough, it all ends in disaster. I don't know how these things get better. You know what I mean? We we have integrated them so quickly into our lives. It's it's. I think it's a little bit faster than anyone thought it was going to be. Yeah, I think we get off of it eventually. I think we eventually get off. You think we That's, stop look you think we stop looking like this and eventually we move our eyes upwards again? I I, I think our kids will. We won't. We're we're screwed. We, yeah, we, yeah, we're fucked. Uh, but like <laughs> I I've, I've actually ran into a couple people who have um apps installed on their phone that essentially like take all the um behavioral science out of the notification systems. The dopamine like the dopamine hits. Mhm. Mm it it's like make makes their phone like a telephone. You know, and like they can, but they have to manually type the app in to open the app. And it's like, it's a very like small change that totally in the end. And they're like, I've noticed my anxiety go down. And I noticed that like, you know, the amount of shit that used to distract me, like it goes down. And I think we're going to dial that in. You know, Oh, I know that we're all addicted and junkies because we, <laughs> as soon as people bring this up to you, you instantly are like, I have to have it. I, I need it. I wouldn't, how would I get my jobs? How would I talk to people? What, what, what do you mean? I would, I would need to go out of my way to personally connect with them. Ridiculous. You, you know, nothing like it's such a, it's the, you know, it's, they live, it's putting on the glasses and 
I think Taylor's right. I think we're all junkies addicted to our cell phones that will, you know, like our IV drips, but our children will go, I don't want to be like, because kids never want to be like their dads, right? I don't want to be like my dad. You don't want to be like your dad. So eventually they're just going to go, oh, we have to go outside. We have to not be our parents. I think the only way that's going to happen where kids are not like us in that sense is if somebody, some Tyler Durden guy, like just blows up the fucking mainframe of the internet. Sure. And suddenly, like, wipes us all out, puts us all at zero, and we're back to banging sticks together for entertainment. Um, Because, and that's the only way we're not going to be in our phones anymore. Well, Mark, you know, but that's what Mark was talking about. You know, the bands that bang the sticks the best are the ones that are getting those crowds. And more of these things are, you know, what is that experience and what can we do with that? I mean, I, 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 that makes me. That makes me happy for the human condition. That means humanity will continue. And that, you know, even when this goes away, we will still be dancing and making songs around the campfire. But it will be a different world by then. Full I mean, the biggest growth the biggest growth industry right now in employment is therapists and caregivers. Um, and then service sector, right? Like actual, like serving you food at, like at a restaurant and things like that. It's the tech jobs that are going away, you know? Uh, so, you know... It's but we can get off that, but you know, like uh, the the kid the kids now who set themselves to being uniquely human in their capacity to do anything is what's going to set them apart from somebody who, because people whose jobs go away are people who operate like a machine. You give me an input and I give you an output. If you operate like a machine, you will be automated away. If you operate like a human and you're able to use intuition and express wisdom and not just knowledge, then you will have like that. That is your your wealth. That's your independence. Your financial independence is not how much money you have in your bank account. It's how much you're able to generate by being a human and not just a cog in someone else's machine. So, you know, that is the biggest thing, you know, and unfortunately, yes, just the same as in the industrial revolution, there are a lot of people who get left behind who are moving into a new age and a lot of people will get left behind. Well, if you be uniquely human, you will be fine. And I think that in new industrial revolution is the right way to look at it because I think we're going to need to get rid of some of these robber barons. And I don't know what that looks like, but I also feel that there is an exploitative nature to all of this stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is that human element that we enjoy. It is the human element of your story, Ray, is what I like. And it's your eye and your, you are making movies. You're making movies in my brain with the pictures that you're doing. And you could maybe put those things into a computer and maybe get a facsimile. But again, there are things that are lost in translation. And this is from the tip of your pencil or electronic tablet, however you draw, wherever these ideas come from. And I am seeing it through your eyes. So, you know, that human element is the thing that I hope does prevail. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so, too. I, I agree with you that, like, AI is not at a point where you can uh, replicate really good ideas and really good storytelling. What scares me is that it will eventually if it, people keep working on it and making it, and maybe not our lifetime, but at some point, it could replace the the human touch. Um, that's why a lot of people are not scared of it right now, because they're like, oh, no, it's not good. It's, it doesn't read the same. It's too dead. It's too, too deadpan, or it's not, there's no soul. Yeah, now. But, you know, it didn't even exist 10 years ago or 20 years ago, whatever. And now it's so far advanced. Um, so I'm the uh, uh, half empty side of Mark's uh, futuristic utopia where everybody's happy. <laughs> well, I'm happy then that you two get to work with each other and bounce ideas off each other. Because what has come from that is this great Tank McGregor and the Cosmic Colossus. Uh, where can people... How do people, they're going to hear it from us, but if they want to continue this journey, where can they go and pick it up? How can they best support this work? Uh, yeah, so right now we have a Kickstarter that is live as we speak for uh, to get your hands on Tank McGregor and the Cosmic Colossus. Um, you can check it out uh, at, on kickstarter.com. Uh, you can get there by following the links on my Instagram, uh, Tank McGregor Comic, and... Um, that's the yeah you're uh, flashing up right now the uh, the the address you're for right. the order yeah um it's full of uh you, you can you can find the book there you can find the first book uh, we have a lot of rewards uh, a lot of books by a bunch of different authors from uh, lesser known comics 
Um, and uh, we have some really interesting add-ons that you can also take out of it. Um, so yeah, and um, that's where you can find it. I trailed off there for a bit. Uh, Mark, uh, Lesser Known Comics, where is the best way to interact with you? Best way to get uh, involved with Lesser Known Comics? Uh, at Lesser Known Comics on Instagram, at Lesser K Comics on Twitter. That was the best we could do. Uh, and then lesserknowncomics.com. Uh, yeah, and I encourage everybody who's, you know, uh, to definitely check it out. Uh, not only the Kickstarter, but if you can't wait and you want to buy the first uh, uh, Tank McGregor and the Mechanical Menace, um, that's at lesserknowncomics.com. Um, and then, yeah, don't be a stranger. Um, you know, we, uh, we have grown in the last two years to have, I think there's 27 titles that are currently in the Lesser Known Comics catalog. And we're adding somewhere between 35 and 55 in the next 12 months. It depends wow. if, you know, like, it depends on like uh, people, whether or not they're they're how quickly they're going to get sequels out and stuff like that. Um, and the crazy thing about this crew is, I mean, yeah, I mean, you were, I mean, Ray was releasing Tank McGregor a year ago, you know, uh, in the Mechanical Menace. Um, uh, and now we're here, you know, uh, a year later and with 175 more pages of unadulterated sci-fi action comedy gold. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's not it's, slowing down. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's weird that we call it a comic book, but we mean it. It is a comic book. Uh, the, you know what I mean? Like, there's a weird thing that people. I almost, I almost feel like we need a different term. It's you. You've done a. a you've done. You know. A it's a trade paperback. Yeah, a you've done it. You're giving us the trade. You're giving us a bunch of weeks of trade paperbacks, but it's the final product, and it makes it a. It was a tough read to put down. I know some people are going back to it. I kept. It just made me kept licking my fingers to want to go to the next page. Ah, oh, dude, that makes me so happy to hear you say that. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you for joining us. Don't be strangers. I would, uh, and and then of course you can come back any day when you want to talk about the robot apocalypse. We can talk about that any day. We don't have to loop that into any special conversations. Tomorrow it is then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a where are they now? Like Mark's yeah. all hit up to the machine like a year from now. And yeah. <laughs> He's like, Mark, I told you. I remember that name. <laughs> uh, that was well, from the, the woods. Form. Yeah. <laughs> Even I in that future, I bet we're still eating carne asada burritos. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that or and that we can take solace at. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Taylor, now that we have that delicious uh, beef fat going right into our bodies, throw up the end of the show. Let's take us home. Uh, you can support us over at the patreon.com slash the cultured nerd. Thank you so much for all of the support that you do give. Uh, thank you for help keeping the lights on. In fact, who are those people keeping the lights on around here? There's those wonderful people. Thank you so much for doing all of that thing. Thank you on Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ray, for coming back and talking with us. It's so wonderful to see all of your fruits. You went away and then came back with beautiful treats. And thank you so much for those wonderful treats. Uh, if you have your cell phones out, give that QR code a uh, scan. Uh, hit Taylor up on the socials. He always wants to know what you're thinking. Uh, what do, uh, If you like this, how often should we have them back? Make us bring Mark back. I'll have more questions to ask him. Let me know. Let's make Ray draw weird things. Let us know. Hit us up on all of those fun places. And uh, we'll uh, talk to all you kids and cats next time. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having us.